Welcome to Microscope, a series of in-depth, critical, comprehensive, and informative conversations about issues that really matter in community. No scripts, no written questions, minimal or no editing. This is what journalism does best. Join me, Steve Betchkel, as we sit down and get down to the matter at hand. Julie, first of all, I want you to tell me a little bit about your background. What is it uh, that, you, that you do? What is your experience with writing? Um, I have been writing for kids for a long time. I started when my own daughter was just a toddler and wanted to be able to stay at home with her. And so I started writing curriculum, actually, for a publishing house in the Twin Cities called Augsburg Fortress and wrote for them for about 15 years while my, both she, my daughter and later my son were growing up. And in the process of that, started also writing stories for children and began researching children's publishing market and learning how to submit stories to publishers. And um, yeah, I just really stuck with the children's writing aspect. What is your uh, professional background in? Uh, youth ministry. Yeah, I worked at churches and camps in my earlier, <laughs> earlier years. Um, so yeah, I went, um, graduated from Luther College in Decor, Iowa with a degree in anthropology which um, weren't a lot of job opportunities as anthropologists, so I uh, went into youth work and uh, also went to Luther Seminary and then just stuck with kind of youth and family ministry. I don't hear a degree in writing in there. In no, English, in yeah. Creative writing. No, not at all. Yeah, I liked to write and I liked to read, um, and I went to a liberal arts college, so there was a lot of that going on, um, and just, I think, Probably just by reading a lot of kids' books to my own children sparked my interest in writing for them, too. And so just began writing stories for kids and, um, again, learning how to submit them and uh, work with publishers. So you, uh, you came up from the basement uh, in terms of uh, self-starting and figuring it all out. You didn't have any kind of training in this. Not really, yeah, and I actually write in the basement, so I'm still there. <laughs> but, um, right, other than, you know, life itself is, is kind of the training ground for any writer, I think, and you uh, look to your own experiences and your own story to kind of shape the stories that you want to tell others. So, um, yeah, but I didn't like have an English major or wasn't in route to become a, a writer or journalist at all. It just kind of came up as I went along. So um, you have one daughter, two daughters? Uh, one daughter and a son. One daughter and a yep, son. Two kids. All right, what are their names? My daughter's name is Micah, and she is 27. And um, my son is Eli. He's 22 and still in college. So when you wanted to write the books for them, how old were they when you started writing? Um, when I was working on my first, very first story that would become a book. There were stories before that. Uh, my daughter was in grade school. She was like third, fourth grade, and that's the age level of the characters. So in that way, she was a, a big inspiration in terms of um, just being able to, to get into the head of a fourth grader <laughs> a little bit and make my characters seem more real. So you felt a need uh, as a mother, as a parent, uh, but you also had this creative urge. And so what? tell me about the origins of this. You were sitting around one night telling stories, and you thought, boy, I should write some of this down. I should write books to entertain my kids. How did it work? How, hmm. how did this all evolve? Um, I actually, uh, in my 20s, read um, the book Bridge to Terabithia by Katherine Patterson and got to the end of that book, and it truly was the first book that made me cry <laughs> and got to the end of it and just felt like, you know, I really want to do this. I mean, I thought she was just an amazing writer, and she is, and one of my favorites. And so that was a big inspiration to me to think I would love to be able to, to write a story that, you know, is this meaningful to me and to others as well. And so between that book and reading a whole lot of books to my kids, um, that that just inspired me. And um, I like kids too. I've worked with kids all my life, and so it just felt like a really good fit to to try to write stories that they would laugh at or um, understand and somehow connect to. Mm -hmm. 
All right, before we go in depth uh, and talk about the books, let's go do a little biblio bibliography. How many books have you written and, uh, you know, over since, what, since when and how many have you written? Okay, well, total books, I have 14. And two of the two series, Friends for Keep series, which has, I've got to do my math now, I have five books in that series, right? And then eight in another series called Victoria Torres, Unfortunately Average. And then I have one standalone, which just came out recently. And um, so I think that adds up to 14. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, we'll come back to that. If I said that uh, the names um, Ren, <laughs> yeah. Ida, and Victoria, can you explain what those, the significance <laughs> of those names to you? Those would be main characters in my books. So um, we'll start with Ren, who's the most recent. She's my standalone book. Um, and that Wren is a fourth grade girl, the book title, Big and Little Questions, according to Wren Jo Bird. So if we back up to Victoria Torres, she's the star in my Victoria Torres Unfortunately Average series, and she's a little bit older, she's a sixth grader, so she's 11, 12 years old in the, that series. And then my very first book and first series, Friends for Keeps, which stars Ida May, and she's a fourth grade girl, so she was my first character that I wrote about that became a book. How did you think of the names for the characters? <laughs> Everyone asks me that. Um, Ida, I knew I wanted a very short, very plain name because that's just kind of encompassed how she was feeling about herself at the start of, of My Last Best Friend. So I don't know, I just, I picked Ida. Uh, Victoria Torres was chosen for me by the publisher, so that was easy. <laughs> and then Wren, uh, her name came about because my favorite place to write is called the Cafe Wren. It's in Luck, Wisconsin, and that's where I grew up. And so when I started to write that book, I was actually at the Cafe Wren, sitting down with my paper and pencil and thought, okay, I'm going to start this book. What am I going to call the character? And saw Wren on my coffee cup and thought, oh, that's a good place to start. We'll just call her Wren, and it stuck, so... All right, I have never been a fourth grade girl. <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> yes, yes. So you're obviously drawing from some personal experience or memories, and you're, you're using mm -hmm. the experience of your, your daughter. Yeah. Explain that process, please. Uh, how is it that you can get into the mind of a fourth grade girl, is, and, and, and what is the mind of a fourth grade girl? Mm. What do you have to do to include in a book to make it attractive to a fourth grader? Mm hmm. Hmm, well, I always say it helps to have the mind of a fourth grader. Ha ha. Um, I, for me personally, I try to spend as much time as I can just in the presence of kids who are the age of my characters. I used to do this easily when my kids were young because I would have birthday parties and sleepovers and I would help out at school. So I was always around kids that age. But if you don't have access to <laughs> live in children, you can. Um, just experience kids at the food court at the mall or at a theater or at a baseball game. Um, and I just I try to pay attention to how kids that age talk to each other, um, how they move, how they dress. And um, as I'm writing, I read aloud a lot as I write, and I try to make sure that I sound like kids sound. And just in terms of how they think, um, yeah, I do. I rely on my own experience as a, as a kid. I do try to think back to how I felt in certain situations, even if they're not identical to my situations in my book. You know, what scared me, what made me laugh as a child, what worried me, and I do try to incorporate that in my stories. So you're studying kids, you're observing kids. Do they provide a lot of times in this study and observation, do they provide the content for you? And all of a sudden you get an idea about hmm. a sentence, um, uh, an event, mm -hmm. um, a, a conflict. Does that come right out of observation? Sometimes, you... yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, with um, Big and Little Questions, my latest book, um, that the seed of that started at a school visit I was doing. Um, I was actually talking about my Friends for Keep series, and in the first book of that series, Ida loses a best friend because the best friend has to move away. And so I always ask the kids, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had a best friend who moved or you had to move? You know, what was that like? And one girl raised her hand and said, yeah, I, uh, my parents got divorced, and so I had to move away, and she just started just... She's probably a fourth grader, 
talking about that so openly, and she was just at such a place with it that I could tell she, she was just in this place of acceptance with her, her family situation. And I, I just wanted to talk to her, you know, longer than I could because I'm in the middle of a school visit and ask her more questions about how she got to that point because I suspected it wasn't always that easy for her to talk about. Um, and so that, for me, was the seed of the idea for the story about Ren. I, I wanted to explore a little bit more how a child gets to a place of acceptance in a, you know, a family that's going through trouble. All right, uh, back to that fourth grade girl uh, mentality, personality, uh, psychology. Pre-adolescence, and in, in, in pretty much you're sticking to you know, mm -hmm. those grades four through six, there is some trepidation at that age. There's also a lot of flexibility. There's a very hungry curiosity. All these things enter into that age. And so these things come out in your characters and your writing. And, and so um, is memory enough to do that? And, and then how do you test whether or not it works? After, you know, do, you, do you have a, a child subject? Oh, you can yeah. test them, or do you wait until they're done and read them and see how they do? Yeah. How do you find out if, these, if it works for a fourth grader? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I have an author friend who does actually take his manuscripts to the kids in classrooms and has them have the children read them and then give him feedback. I've never done that, but that's a good idea. Um, I think it just it has to make sense to me first, I guess. It has to feel right to me, and I hope that it's right to the kids too. And so far it seems like it has been that I've gotten the tone correct and um, the, the relationships seem correct to me. So in that way... Yeah, I guess there's there's no like tried and true way to make it happen that the story is going to connect with the kids. But on the same token, then, all right, you're you're trying to reach out to a general girl, a fourth grade girl, a, mm -hmm. a girl that's age 10, 11, 12. How do you change up the voices then in the characters to make them authentic? If you're if you're trying to reach an audience, but you want your characters to stand alone, how do you do that? Mm hmm. I read aloud a lot, make sure that my voice sounds good to my ear and um, true to the kids that I know and that I hear around me. I know, it's like I wish there was this formula <laughs> to follow, and maybe there is, and I haven't discovered it yet. But I, when I write, I, I am a big fan of revision, and I rewrite manuscripts many, many times. I run them past uh, friends who also write, and let them give me feedback, what's ringing true to them. My editor has lots of comments sure. when um, she reads through things. So I think that's probably the most important part of writing is the rewriting until you get it, till it sounds correct and authentic. Who is your editor? Um, for most of my books, it's Kathy Dawson. Okay. She um, has her own imprint with um, Penguin Putnam. Oh, okay. And so where does she... Out in New York? She's in New York. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so uh, is there a lot of change that goes on from the beginning to the end in terms of content and direction or just the shape of the thing? Yeah. For me, I, yeah, I have lots of changes to make. Yeah. Sometimes the entire book changes uh, and many details change throughout. Um, for big and little questions, I was playing with kind of two ideas. Ren from a family who was recently divorced and kind of that was part of the story and then I also wanted Ren to be starting this club with friends at school so I had two things going and my editor finally said I think you gotta pick one got too much going on here and so I chose Ren and her family situation and I started all over had to take everything out regarding this club aspect and really rewrite the story and of course she was right it's a much stronger story by taking away a lot of the excess that wasn't needed. For children's books, that is the case, too. Isn't it? If you're writing for adults, you could be as complicated. You could, be, you could go <laughs> yeah, Faulkner on the audience. Yeah, you know, yeah. Or, or uh, you know, uh, James Joyce. But with, with uh, children's books, mm -hmm. you do have to remember to keep it a little simple mm -hmm. and to keep your um, theme 
Yes, definitely. Limited in some sense. Yeah. Uh, maybe limited isn't the right word, but focused. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And that age level is, which is probably one of the reasons I like it so much, fourth, fifth grade, is because they are transitioning from very concrete, childlike thinking to, a, to being able to think more abstractly. And, but they're not quite there yet. So I do have to definitely, like you said, keep things focused. Um, remember that some of the readers will still are still learning how to read, and so I don't want to make it so complex that they feel like, you know, they they just can't get a handle on the story itself, and yet want to play a little bit with with the more abstract ideas and have kids think a little bit outside the box. So. It's, um, it's the transition that interests me from childhood to adolescence and playing with that and trying to get it right. Okay. You mentioned you, you like to get, make kids laugh. Is entertainment the primary focus here, or is it a little education? Is um, it helping to you know, get the psychology of a fourth grader, you know, give it support? What, what is in, your, in writing, what is your ideal here? Mm-hmm. I would say so much education. Um, I, hmm, it sounds a little corny, but just want the child, that one reader, to be able to find themselves in the story and just regard that book as a friend to them and a place that they can escape to that story and think about their own life and how it relates to what's going on in the, in the characters' stories. My stories do tend to get a little on the deep side because I am interested in, in having kids uh, think about their emotions and their relationships. So in that way, they're, they do dive a little deep, but we balance that with the humor and the fourth grade antics and drama that happens in the fourth grade <laughs> classroom or uh, schoolyard. So yeah, I guess there is that balance, and that's probably important for any story that you balance the harder, grittier, deeper stuff with lighter uh, humor. Yeah, do both. Let's talk about your regimen. You, you work full-time here at the university? Um, 60%. 60%, yeah. okay. So what is your writing regimen? How do you, how do you find time to write? Yeah, you... Well, and actually my job here at the university is pretty new. So I was working at home, writing pretty much all the time, and now we're trying this new little life adventure, so that's fun. Um, but I, like like many writers, like to write in the morning when my brain is fresh and the coffee's hot and um, get some writing time in then. And usually that's when I try to, to write new stuff. And then th later in the day, maybe go back and, and do the editing and revising that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of, of not just sitting at a computer and typing, but also kind of writing throughout the day. I always carry... Um, paper with me and a pen or a pencil and jot things down throughout the day. If I hear a little dialogue going on, I might just, you know, take a note or if I get an idea for a story or a scene, I'll write that down as I go throughout my day, whatever I'm doing. How, uh, how often do books get written? Uh, do, how long does it take you to write a book? <laughs> well, when I'm working on a series so that I've already have an established cast of characters, then it's, you know, it's about maybe a year to, to create a manuscript that um, we can work with, my editor and I. Um, Big and Little Questions, I worked on for several years and many revisions before I finally got that story right. That's the one where I was kind of playing with two stories and had to finally just abandon the one and focus on the other. So that was a good three years. Hmm. Yeah. And um, so one a year maybe? Let's yeah, say. Let's, let's say one a year. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of ideas for a book about kids, I'm, I'm going to guess and say, wow, that must be an unlimited topic. You could, mm. you could find something in, you know, that affects a kid's life, just about anything. You could write forever on what affects fourth graders, couldn't you? Is there a limit? Hmm. I don't know. I haven't found one yet, so I'll keep on trying to find new ways to look at situations that many fourth graders go through. All right, let's try a little different direction here. Um, again, I, I, I was a boy fourth grader, 
Is it different, the, the, the elements in a book written for fourth grade girls, is it not just the obvious things that her, her, their friends are, are girls, um, she is female, the character is female, but are the things that attract a reader to that book any different than it would be to a boy? If you write for a girl, do you have to include different mm -hmm. things than you would if you were trying to attract a boy reader? Yeah, it's kind of a, a tricky topic just because sometimes we put boys into this category of you got to make it, you know, easier or, um, you know, they have to have pictures or a comic or something. And I don't know that that's so true um, and that girls can handle, you know, girls will read stories about boys or girls and guys have to have books about guys or dogs or something. And again, I don't know if that's true. One of my favorite things that happens when I do school visits because my books look like they're for girls you know there's a girl on the cover and the color is kind of you know purple and pink and whatnot I love it when boys come up to me on the sly and say you know I really like your book <laughs> you know, they've read it in class or whatever so ah, man I don't know I, I, I think boys and girls can both appreciate books that are a bit grittier and deeper and um, yeah it's maybe just um, putting it into their hands and saying you know give this one a try and, and um, let them take it from there. Again we're talking about pre-adolescent kids and so their experiences may be a lot alike. I mean do the boys laugh at the jokes? Yeah well if you have a butt joke in there that's a really <laughs> good idea yeah and the girls laugh at those too but um, a couple of food fights is always handy. Sure low brow. Low brow <laughs> yeah <the> exactly. <laughs> um, they laugh at a lot of the same stuff I think yeah. And so there are there are probably um, uh, questions about uh, life and about growing up that are equal to both sexes and, and, and that would be attractive to both. I'm just curious at, at your perspective as a feminine writer, do you feel that um, when you speak to girls, are you speaking only to girls? And you, you've kind of answered that, that boys mm -hmm. do read the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I guess I don't feel that way. Yeah, and when I visit schools or libraries, you know, it's always a mixed group and, well, not always, but usually I do sometimes just visit the Girl Scouts or whatever, but um, I feel like I just have a pretty good rapport with both boys and girls and I think that comes through in my storytelling too, that, um, you know, here's the story, it happens to be a girl who's telling it, but her situation could be your situation too, her struggles her um, insecurities, they're general, I think, enough that um, girls and boys can see themselves in the character. Now, your, your son, uh, obviously, did, were the books done in enough time for you to share them with a fourth grade daughter? Or fifth grade daughter? Um, she, yeah, well, she was a little bit older by the time they were done, so she was still not the age of the characters, but yeah. But you read them, they read, your kids read them? And um. <laughs> Yeah, and in my experience, kids are the worst. Your own children are the worst people to have read your stories because they were extremely critical. I finally stopped letting them read them until they were in print. But, really? Um, they were critiquing the story? Oh, my gosh, yeah. What, what, what kind of things would, it, would your children say? Oh, they would just tear them to pieces. Really? They didn't like something about them? I may be exaggerating slightly. Okay. So, so they, uh, your son... Uh, did they react differently to the stories? You know, uh, as far your son is younger. Yes, he okay. is. So he would, yeah, he was a fourth grader when uh, my first book, My Last Best Friend, was being published. So my daughter's a few years older than him. So, um, and he loves to write too. So in that way, I think he he really enjoys reading what what I read or what I write. Yeah. Do, do they see themselves in the characters, or are those characters not them My at all? daughter, very much so. Be, well, Ida, at least, because really that story was when she was growing up. So she, she is very much like that character, and she knows it. And everyone that I've ever talked about the book to knows <laughs> that, it, that Ida's, her personality is very much based yeah. on my daughter. You probably couldn't yeah. help it. I mean, you were probably drawing material. Yeah, I really was. Daughter. Yeah, even though the story itself wasn't her story, right. the personality of Ida is very much her, her personality. Yeah. 
Um, let's uh, see here. Um, since you started writing the books, you started your homegrown writer. You kind of, you, you know, you, you learn to do this. Are you getting better with each book? Are, is your mm -hmm. writing process, are you a better writer just because you write? Oh, yeah, definitely think so. Yeah. Um, just, it still takes me a long time to write a story, but I think I more quickly can see, I guess I'm, I'm better at knowing that this is not going to be perfect right off the bat. You know that there's going to be many drafts, and, and that's just something you have to accept. Um, I think when I first started out and was, was writing a story, I felt like this is great and um, it's perfect the way it is, can't get any better. So in that way, I know that I have to uh, I'll be willing to revise to make it a better story. You sound very flexible and that revision process can be hard for some writers. Uh, it's a very personal process writing. If you have an idea and you really love it and somebody says, no, no, we're going to change mm -hmm. it all. And it's not hard for you? It used to be harder than it is now. Oh. Yeah. I've just learned, I guess, that um, it will get better with more revision. So you're trusting your editor. You've learned to trust mm -hmm. the editor, and, the, and mm -hmm. the editor knows what she's doing. Yeah, and friends, too, that, that read. I think that's, if, if you want to write, that's probably the best place to start is to uh, find a few trusted friends who will give you good constructive criticism and go from there. So in your personal life, um, how important is this creative process of writing to you personally, to who you are? Yeah, I think pretty important. Um, it just gives me a place to uh, record my own thoughts and feelings and allows just the language and the words allow you to kind of get below the surface of yourself and discover some things about yourself that maybe you didn't really realize until you start writing the story that that belongs to this character but it's really your story too. Well, can you give me an example of that? What do you mean by that? Because again if you're writing for a fourth grade girl I wouldn't see mm -hmm. that um, that applying to you the adult writer. Well really I think no matter what your age though those same feelings uh, apply. You know I, I have my own insecurities in relationships and so does Ida or so does Ren, it's maybe not on the same level, but the, the same feelings I think are there. So being willing as a writer to uh, crack open your, the, the surface of you and really allow your, your more tender feelings to show through the story it's hard to do that. It's hard to do it well and truthfully, but when you do, then you've got a story to work with. You have to, as a writer, be willing to, um, yeah, be willing to go deeply into yourself in order to make your character be a, a real, authentic person. It sounds to me like you're saying that writing makes you vulnerable. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I think if you're, if you're trying to write and not allow vulner vulnerability to come in, your story is going to feel bland and um, just, you know, not, not um, real, not like real characters. Like most writers, uh, you haven't struck it rich yet. You're not yet. <laughs> trying. <laughs> is that an objective or is it just that, you know, is it, you know, it, do you take pride in production? Or just, just the creative process just feed your soul so much that, you know what, the money be damned, I'm just having fun. <laughs> well, money's nice, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think if you're imagining writing as, as you know, your ticket to, to success and fame and fortune, you may want to go down a different path. <laughs> this might not be the one to choose. Uh, I think the majority of writers do it just from a love of writing, and I really enjoy kids of all ages, and so being able to put something into their hands that they seem to enjoy is very satisfying to me. Okay, you don't seem, you seem like a very humble person to me. Oh. So, so how does Thanks. ego fit, fit into this? Do you, do, you, do you enjoy it when people recognize the name Bovi, uh, that they recognize you as an author? That they, when, when they come up to you and they say, oh, I've read your book, what, how does that make you feel? Is that important to you? Yeah, 
That's a little intimidating, actually. I'm not, yeah, I'm not one who enjoys the spotlight too much. So uh, I've gotten more and more used to that. And maybe that's part of why it's nice to write for kids. It seems somehow less threatening when it's a child running up to you and giving you a hug and saying, I love your stories, than an adult that's walking up and telling you that um, they've read your stories. So um, I've gotten more used to it over the years. But the important thing is to be read. I mean, to every artist, every writer, you want to be read. Sure. That's nice. (laughs) Although it's maybe not imperative that I'm read. I hope that people will enjoy my stories. I write them for kids, but again, I think I also mostly write them for myself. I think that's probably true for most writers. If you're not in the one that this story is for, then you're maybe, again, not getting deep enough into yourself to uh, uh, make it worthwhile for others to read. Mm -hmm. Yes, as writers, we start out being very much, um, it starts as as an internally driven motivation that it's a personal expression but the idea of connection mm-hmm. is is it validates the work if you don't connect then you might as well put it in the drawer because if, it, if you can't connect yeah. with somebody else then it, it wasn't much of a, of a success story mm-hmm. was it? Mm-hmm. um do you have the next idea ready to go what are you working on <laughs> right now i'm working on this new job <laughs> And um, I don't have a specific idea, but I am just, like I said, I love to just kind of jot ideas down, thoughts down. Um, I work with a lot of college students right now, so I'm actually toying with the idea of trying to write something for a little bit older audience, really? something a little different. Um, they're a very inspiring group. <laughs> I supervise eight students at the front desk in the Academic Skills Center, and they're a great bunch, and they're offering lots of inspiration for story ideas, so that's Hmm. been fun. So who knows, maybe I'll try something a little bit older. Well, that's quite a change up. Yeah, that would be, well, when I first started out, my dream was to be a picture book writer. I thought that would be the route for me, and that I tried to be published as a picture book writer. That did not work out, and so then moved into the more of the chapter book, early novel, area, which is a good fit for me, and I like it, but thinking a little bit about what it would be like to write something for a little bit older audience. Mm-hmm. All right. Is there anything else you would like to add about the books, um, your writing process, what you get out of anything at all? Hmm. Um, kids always ask, where do you get your ideas? And I tell them, ideas come from everywhere and the important thing is you know to start to write them down so if you wish to write really what you need to do is write (laughs) is to actually do it and sometimes we talk about writing and we don't actually sit down and do the process the hard work of of getting the draft out there so i think that's probably the most important thing to do is actually do the writing and do it often doesn't have to be spectacular writing, but uh, get the words down. Mm-hmm. How many times have you heard somebody say, that, oh, I, I have this book idea that's not really on, yes. they never write it down. They yes, do that, that's that happened it is hard more than once, yes. Mm-hmm. And they'll ask, oh, have you, have you sought publication? Have you looked into it all? Oh, well, I haven't written it yet, but it would be a great story. <laughs> and so, you, yes, you definitely have to do the, do the work of the writing itself. Mm-hmm. Do uh, kids ever come up and ask you for your autograph with the book? Yes, <laughs> that's very fun. And I get to let them choose their color of pen that they want, so that makes it fun, too, and it becomes personalized for them. So, yeah. Julie, anything else you want to say? Um, no, just thanks for letting me come and talk for a little bit. And, um, yeah, I don't know what else to add. Sorry. <laughs> well, it'll, it'll be interesting uh, in, in looking at your books. It's always fun for me to uh, know something about the author when I read a book and to picture the person behind the story mm. and to think of that person uh, and their input and that process of deciding and writing and um, how they come about to finalize a product. I think that's interesting to understand the person behind the work. So mm. thank you for taking the time to talk about your, your writing. Well, thanks for inviting me. Sure. Thank you for joining us today for Microscope. We've got more on many great topics. Look for us online at www.cvctv.org.